Hi Central Baptist, good morning, welcome to church. Uh, it's great to be with you, even if it is over the slightly weird medium of Facebook or YouTube. Uh, we hope that you're staying well, we hope that you're staying safe, uh, and we're just really, really enjoying this fantastic run of weather we've had. Uh, everybody's wearing shorts and jandals and getting out uh, into uh, the good weather, so we hope that you're well and we hope that you're enjoying uh, this as well. So hey, here's a, just a couple of notices that we'd like to uh, run through just before we get into our service this morning. First of all, there's uh, just a quick reminder about the vaccine Q&A that will be happening uh, this afternoon um, upstairs in the Rainbow Room uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, two of our in-house doctors here at Central Baptist uh, will be available uh, just to ask, answer any questions or queries that you might have uh, around the vaccine. And then last but not least, short notices this morning, uh, we'd like to just remind you of the citywide pre-night that's meeting in four different locations around the city on the 7th of November. Um, that takes the place of the one night um, uh, combined service uh, because unfortunately obviously with the numbers restrictions we're not able to meet uh, all together like we usually do. Uh, so just um, be aware of where the lo those locations are uh, on the 7th of November. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's lovely uh, to have you and we hope that you enjoy our service. Blessings. Hi, I'm Tawia and this is Levi, my little brother. Um, I'm 17 and I go to James Hargist. I'm in my last year of school. I'm 15 and I'm year 11 at school, so first year of NCEA. Right, so what's one thing on your bucket list? Oh, well, one day I want to be able to go to the United States of America. What about you? Well, I would like to be a snow instructor, like a snowboard instructor in Canada for a season. That'd be real fun. What's your favourite family or personal tradition? Uh, probably just going up to Manapuri whenever we can in the holidays and, you know, skiing, swimming, everything fun. Yep. Um, my favourite one would probably be, um, it seems to be the last few years that we spent Christmas in Manapuri, we've managed to have a Christmas Day ski, um, which I've really liked, so. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best advice you've ever received? Uh, I heard this quote once, um, you, everyone lives two lives and the second one begins when you realise that you only live one. What about mm -hmm. you? Um, mine would be from Andy on The Office um, and he says about how um, I wish there was a way to know that these are the good old days before um, you get to them because, you know, they, you cherish every moment because before you realise it, you look on, back on this is the good old days. Um, other than Jesus, which famous person in history would you spend time with? Oh, I think I'd have to go to, with Andre the Giant. I reckon he'd be a good laugh and he'd be huge. he be quite funny, I reckon. What about you? Um, mine would probably be Dean Boxall. He is the coach of the Australian swimmer Ariane Titmus, and she beat Katie Ledecky in the 400 metre freestyle at the Olympics. And he was the Australian coach that went absolutely nuts on the side of the pool. Um, so I think he would be quite funny to hang out with. Looks sort of like Doc Brown. I mean. <laughs> and what do you love about Jesus? Oh, i got to be the fact that I know that I'm loved no matter what and everyone is loved the same. What about you? Um, probably um, the thing I like about Jesus is that he's my rock and that's how I roll. So, yeah. Thanks. Hi. Hope you're having a great day um, as you're uh, watching this online. A beautiful day today uh, outside. Uh, not that I've seen too much of it, but um, it's a cracker of a day. Jesus uh, once made this prediction. He said, there's a time coming when Christians will turn away from faith. Uh, Christians will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will lead people astray. Uh, people do miracles, yet not be part of the kingdom. Sin will be rampant. The love of many will grow cold. Now, there are many times throughout the centuries that this description would apply. But I think there's no doubt it's true 
for this time for the church, particularly the church in the Western world. This series is called Faithfulness in Age of Deception. You could say that that's the key theme uh, for uh, the letter in the Bible called Second Timothy. It's, it's just one little book near the end of the Bible. Written by Paul, it's the last letter we have before he's executed for his faith. It's written to a younger colleague, someone who's in the firing line. And he's in a church that's in trouble and being threatened by all kinds of heresies. And Timothy has this tough assignment in front of him. And his mentor is languishing in prison miles away. <laughs> that's not the situation that we face. Uh, we're not in such a place. Uh, but we can certainly feel out of our depth. We can certainly feel as if we're drowning. <laughs> we can certainly feel beaten down by life or people. We can feel we don't know what we do need to do. We don't, we don't know what we need to do next. Uh, we can relate to that. Might be family stuff, marriage stuff, COVID stuff, financial stuff, work stuff, church stuff. Friendship stuff. Life is just messy. Uh, it just seems, sometimes it just seems incredibly messy. It can be grief and anger, frustration, fear, shame. Life, I don't know, it just seems to have a habit of throwing curveballs that way. Often when we least expect it, <laughs> when things are going really well, then suddenly we just out of the blue comes a curveball. If that's you now, then this is relevant. Right now, to you. If it's not relevant right now, <laughs> then I can almost guarantee it will be at some point in the future. We're just going to go through the second chapter of Second Timothy. We're going to go through uh, verse by verse, as it were, uh, in, in, in sections. But um, yeah, And the first thing that uh, in the second chapter that Timothy just encourages, uh, Paul, sorry, just encourages Timothy, is he says, be strong. Timothy, my dear son, dear son be strong. Through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You've heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who are about to pass them on to others. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For then they can't please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes can't win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labour. Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. He, he uses three common figures from ancient times. A soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And he's told to ponder, to really think about these pictures. Now, probably most of us have not served in the armed forces. We, we might not even know anyone uh, in the armed forces. Athletes and farmers, they're, yeah, we're more used to those in New Zealand. Uh, we, we understand a little bit more about them. But a soldier, um, for a soldier, obedience is absolutely key. It's a basic training drilled into a soldier time and time again is obedience. Obedience to the commands of the superior officer. You might not understand, but you're to obey. And the second thing... Uh, drilled, as it were, into a soldier is out of sacrifice. Soldiers often are putting their bodies on the line, as it were, and um, sacrificing themselves for the mission. General Foch was a French military commander during the First World War, and he once was overheard saying to an officer, you must not retire, you must hold on at all costs. Now, the officer was aghast and said, well, that means we all must die. Fox said precisely, <laughs> precisely. Athlete, um, the word actually used here seemingly is a word for a professional athlete. They had them back in Paul's day too. Uh, they were celebrities, just like our professional athletes are today. What's the picture here? Well, athletes are incredibly self-disciplined. They train day in, day out. Whether they feel like it or not, they don't get up and say, I don't feel like training today. Now, there's, there's a great self-discipline. They discipline their eating, their sleeping. Everything they do, they do with a discipline. And Paul says, too, that you know sportsmen or athletes have to follow the rules. Last years, you know, with, around the world, many sportsmen have tried to shortcut their training by taking drugs and uh, being found out. And then he says to ponder the farmer. 
farmers are hard working. It's not a nine to five job. You talk to the farmers at the moment about lambing. They can be up in the night with rain and sleet and, uh, or if the hay needs cutting, you know, they cut it. We've got some paddocks next to us on our property and uh, I've seen them actually doing it at midnight. They've been woken up by the tractor at midnight cutting the hay. The other thing about farmers is there's a patience about them. Nothing is instant in farming. It takes years to develop a property or, you know, they might do something, but like sow their crops, but it takes the whole season. They've got to wait patiently for the growth. When Paul says to Timothy, be strong, how does that apply to us? Well, you know, I think sometimes we need to understand that following Christ can be hard. It takes effort on our part. Sure, we're saved by grace, but it doesn't mean that we're just to sit back and do nothing. He's encouraging Timothy to say, look at the sacrifices a soldier makes. That's what it means to follow Christ. Look at the obedience of a soldier at orders. That's what it means to follow Christ. Look at an athlete. Regardless of whether they feel like or not, they're training every day. Look at how an athlete has to follow the rules. Look at a farmer, he works all day. To follow Christ is not a part-time job, it's an all-of-life job. And farmers take a long-term view. So keep sowing into people's lives. Keep working even when you see no result. Be strong. Let these people inspire you as to what it means to follow Christ. Now, this kind of message is not one we hear much about today. It's what Jesus meant when he said, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross. Actually, there's sacrifice and hard work and discipline involved in that. But he also reminds Timothy it's going to be worth it. Remember that Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, the descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach, and because I preach this good news, I'm suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained, so I'm willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure hardship, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. The commentators say that these, those, those last verses, um, this trustworthy saying, is probably part of an old hymn. The early church didn't have the resources we have, and so they used hymns to remember key theologies. Don't you love though, the phrase before, the word of God cannot be chained? That's an amazing truth, because... You know, no matter how over the years governments have tried to shut down the gospel, the gospel keeps spreading. But Paul's saying, hey, there's salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus. He's saying to Timothy, don't forget the prize, the goal. Like the soldier with his mission, or the athlete with his prize, or the farmer with his harvest, be strong, because there's an incredible goal at the end that we get to live with Christ in the kingdom to come, where there's no tears or pain, or suffering. The application for us is no matter what you're going through at the moment, in the grand scheme of things, it will pass. You have an incredible future in front of you. God is still on the throne. Hang in there with whatever you're going through, because the best is yet to come. And I love the next bit. He just reminds Timothy that God is faithful. For we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. It's the last bit of the hymn or fragment of the hymn that we have. And the line before said, if we deny him, he'll deny us. Echoing the words that Jesus said when he said, if we're ashamed of him on the day of judgment, he'll be ashamed of us. And that would be a scary place to end because all of us have denied Christ at times. We can be tempted to look back at our own failures and this is this last line is one of great encouragement. God is faithful even when we are not faithful. You might feel like you're failing at the moment. You might be under pressure and you might be aware that under that pressure you're struggling to trust him or you might be racked by doubt or you might be very aware of the sin that just keeps seeming to trip you up time and time again. The good news, the great news, is that God will not give up on you, that God is stronger than you. God will keep hanging on to you. God will not turn his back on you. God is faithful. Paul goes on then and he encourages Timothy to keep pure. Remind everyone about these things and command them in God's presence to stop fighting over words. 
Such arguments are useless and they can ruin those who hear them work hard. So you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behaviour. This kind of talk spreads like cancer, as in the case of Hermenes and Philetus. They have left the path of truth, claiming the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. This way they have turned people away from the faith. God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this instruction. The Lord knows those who are his. And all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. In wealthy homes, some utensils are made of gold and silver and some are made of wood or clay. The expensive utensils are kept used for special occasions and the cheap ones are used for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you'll be a special utensil for honourable use. Your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the master to use you for, uh, for every good work. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. What does this mean? Well, the first bit is straightforward. Paul's encouraging Timothy to use the God, word of God well. Uh, that means we need to understand it, study it, use it well. To avoid getting sucked into pointless arguments. There's a strange bit then about utensils made of wood and clay and some of gold and silver. It's confusing. I couldn't make sense of it. Um, I did some digging into this and... Uh, the contrast is not so much between having a flash cutlery set and a plastic one. Um, you know, in your house you've got, you might have the good silver that you use and then the cheap stuff. But the underlying meaning is, is more one of, imagine you've got one of those scoops you use to clean out the poo from the cat's litter box. You'd never use one of those to eat your food off at the table. This is about keeping pure so it can be used by God. So the, the cat pooper scoop is not really of any use other than cleaning out the poop. <laughs> but if you're pure, you can be used for God's work. That's why it says run from anything that stimulates you for lusts. Now we tend to think, of, when we hear that, we tend to think in sexual terms. and It's one application, it's not a wrong one. But, but youth can be impatient, youth can be arrogant. And given the context of false teachers and arguments, this is probably what Paul means in this case. The application is really clear. When we're allowing sin in our lives, we limit the ability of God to work through us. Is there sin in our life that we're tolerating, that we're grieving the spirit out of? Maybe it is lust or pornography or sexual sin of some kind. Or maybe it's idols that are dominating your lives. Or it might be bitterness that we've allowed to fester or pride that's puffed us up. Maybe our language and jokes have become crude and coarse. Have we become an unclean vessel? Is it only of use to clean out the cat poo? <laughs> but not much else. What are we allowing in our lives that's defiling us? God is a holy God. His Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Pursue purity. We've lost something of that in our teaching in the church. Pursue purity. And lastly, he says, be kind. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts, and they'll learn the truth. Then they'll come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they've been held captives by him to do whatever he wants. In this context, Paul is instructing Timothy on how to deal with the difficult, argumentative, and deceived teachers within the church. And note the words he uses about how to deal with them. To be kind, to be patient, to be gentle. Sure, he sees that they've been deceived by the enemy, but he's clear that Timothy is to be really careful on how he confronts them. He's not to follow their example, but to approach them with love. Again, the application is really relevant to us. We all have difficult people in our lives. You might be sitting beside them, I don't know. Um, and you know, some people just get under our skin. Some debates seem to rile us up, where others we just are not too worried. And at times like that, it's very easy to start labelling people or losing our call with people. I mean, maybe the current COVID debate is a good example. Sure, it's not the same situation, but, but Paul's instructions to Timothy here are just as relevant. Kindness, gentleness, Patience, no matter what we think of the other person's view. Kindness, gentleness, patience.
If you're struggling at the moment, these are God's words for you to be strong. Ponder the soldier, the athlete, the farmer. It'll be worth it. You'll have an amazing future. He is faithful even when you uh, are not. Keep pure so God can keep working for you. Be kind no matter how others behave. Let's pray. God, we recognise these words of Paul's words to Timothy, but Lord, they're also your words to us. God, you've been speaking to us this morning. Holy Spirit, show us how you want us to respond. For those, Lord, that need encouragement this morning, God, I pray your words to Timothy to be strong would resonate. God, for those that are feeling discouraged and can't see one foot in front of them, God, I pray you give them a fresh vision of the future, the amazing future we have in you. God, for those that feel like they've blown it, God, remind them that you are faithful. God, if there are things in our lives that are hindering you working through us, the words keep pure. Now for us, show us, Lord God, those areas that we need to deal with and bring before you and into the light. Lord, if our words of late have not been kind, give us the grace to speak kindly to all those we meet. God, show us how to live a life that truly glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, may God bless you. Love to see you. Um, if you'd like prayer during the week, uh, just want to touch base i know we're in these strange times um please just give us a ring uh, contact through email um hopefully or if you got uh, a survey sent out we really need your feedback on how we operate in the future so i uh, appreciate if you could do something about that for that in for us um yeah but please even though uh maybe we are a bit disconnected at the moment please uh, get in touch uh if uh, you need some help in any way may god bless